question for today is around water quality. Um, how do we evaluate water quality with the tools that we have relative to the needs of key species, food webs, and habitats? But so when we think about water quality holistically, we want to keep our uh, kind of revision on all of these issues that are related to water quality in the Salish Sea. However, for today and for the, the work that we're doing right now, we're really focusing on nutrients, not just low dissolved, it's just not dissolved oxygen as a single parameter. The dissolved oxygen is the lowest. Um, it's, it's in these terminal inlets and abeyance. And um, so it really isn't a sound wide, you know, one, one size fits all kind of situation, but uniformly 365 days a year. So let's look at what the models and the monitoring data say about the seasonality and the, the longer term variability. The reason you really want to be careful with the period of record is that you can see um, you can see a different you can make a different observation depending on what years you choose. Um, and so because there are these large scale climate oscillations, um, changes in uh, reflux, changes in upwelling. So there's all these different um, interannual patterns. They show a few highlights from from central and down in Strait of Juan de Fuca is that, um, so we did see, I mentioned this uh, increase of dissolving nitrogen in the upper, integrated the upper um, 35 meters of the water column, um, as well as some, uh, in, in the contrary, we saw the decreases in the Juan de Fuca Strait. So what, what, it, what is interesting about this is that we can really find different patterns and different trends depending on um, which area of the Salish Sea we're in. Um, and then another interesting note is that the, the nutrient ratio of silica to dissolve inorganic nitrogen, um, oftentimes this can help to be an indicator of um, uh, potential stress and human impact in places that are um, heavily impacted by nutrient pollution, like the Northern Gulf of Mexico. What, what was observed was a decrease in the silica to DIN ratio over, over a long, long time periods. Um, and interestingly, in Central Basin, we're seeing a uh, similar increase in silica so that the, the silica to DIN ratio was actually increasing. On the contrary, we're not seeing that in the Juan de Fuca. Next slide. So for um, chlorophyll concentrations, the, the, the story is much um, less clear, and as I'm sure we'll talk more about in future workshops, um, that there's not a clear pattern that was observed um, apart from a single increase at one station over that 20 year record. The um, dissolved oxygen, interestingly, also did not observe any clear changes. Um, looking over a, um, a long time record, there seem, seems to be some some non-significant small um, increases in oxygen, but there's not a significant change in central Puget Sound. So looking at the comparison over the last um, century is that there was pretty limited data for nutrients, especially nitrate. Nitrate analyses didn't really um, uh, get improved until the 1960s. Um, levels are somewhat comparable. The, the, uh, what was interesting by diving into this is that there was a clear temperature increase in, in deep central Puget Sound waters, depending on the, on the season, um, of half to one degree, and did not see any clear changes in salinity or DO, which have much longer records than nutrients thus far. See in the central basin is, is that these uh, nitrate concentrations, of deep nitrate concentrations are pretty comparable with the interesting pattern in the, in the summer where it looks like the historical concentrations were a bit higher. And so I think there's an opportunity to really ex further dive in and delve in to explore the drivers for what's going on um, for these long-term changes. Um, but I think uh, that would be a, a good service to the community is to, to quality control this data set and get this available. So we can really, I think the benefit is understanding how things have changed. So just to briefly mention how this, uh, these sort of trends compare with what we're seeing in more larger scale Pacific Ocean patterns. This is just another thing to keep in mind is understanding the, the context of what's happening in the ocean and how that influences the Salish Sea as well. Where you are, definitely the 
matters. And so as uh, Joel mentioned that, you know, um, terminal inlets and bayments are going to be more susceptible to eutrophication than places like the central basin and the strait. Um, and it's really important to evaluate impairment indicators beyond just nutrient concentrations. That just gives us a snapshot, but we want to look and dive into other, um, other biological indicators as well. And um, variability is going to be present in any data set. And so I think having a consistent long-term monitoring is really a key to understanding these changes. And because we do have gaps in how we understand how the ecosystem works, I think having multiple biological indicators of different types of communities is going to really come in handy for understanding this. And also to keep in mind about the increasing temperatures and other climate change impacts that are happening and how these are gonna play a role as well. California Regional Bite is that there's a monitoring program that goes on every five years. Um, that's a collaboration between over 50 agencies. There are questions that maybe could be informed by employing tools like stable isotopes, in particular stable isotopes and nitrogen is what I'm going to focus on. Also, we might want to know where's nitrogen coming from that is entering into the sound. Okay, so I'm going to just do quick three vignettes on isotopic studies that I've that are in, have been done in the Puget Sound that are relevant to nutrients. Um, I'm going to try my best to focus on the more on the tool and the application rather than the res specific results. And so there's a pretty clear positive relationship between N15 and what we would expect to be the influence of wastewater treatment plants. And that makes sense because wastewater treatment plants should have an enriched N15 value, right? They're the generally hasn't been looked at a lot, but you know, the expected N15 for nitrogen coming out of wastewater treatment plants is about 20 per mil. And background in the Puget Sound is generally around eight or nine per mil. And so you can see that as this kind of influence of wastewater treatment plants increases, that N15 is reflected in the biota, right? And so that's, again, kind of a key point here is that we're talking about the biota. We're actually making that link to the biota. Um, other thing about this graph I want to point out is the magnitude on the y-axis, right? So the total change across these sites is one per mil, right? And that's not very much, actually. And one of the things that could be done with data like these is do simple uh, two-source mixing models that say, hey, the background nitrate is expected to be about eight, nine. The wastewater treatments expect to be about 20, maybe a little higher. What's the proportion of the nitrogen in these mussels that comes from uh, wastewater treatment plants? And I haven't done the calculation, but I can look at these data and say it's pretty small. It's probably about five-ish percent would be my best guess. As we're looking at these isotopic ratios in the top predator in the system, right? And so that nitrogen comes in from whatever source it is, but it has to move through the entire food web of the Puget Sound to get to that harbor seal. Um, and so that's important, right? Because now we've gone from just asking what's, what's the dynamics of the nitrogen that exists in Puget Sound to what's the dynamics of the nitrogen in the food web itself, in the biology. The delta N15 of phenylalanine. And phenylalanine is, a, is an essential amino acid that animals can't synthesize. And so it's passed without change up the food web. And it generally reflects the isotopic signature of the primary producers at the base of the food web. And so now we have a tool that is tracking the isotopic signature of the primary producers at the base of the food web through time because we went back and got these samples from seals out of museums, okay? And so uh, two interesting, important points, right? We're, we're honing in on the biology and it gives us another tool to go and look over time where we don't have direct data. And a kind of most influential covariate on this value, this nitrogen N15 of phenylalanine is, um, up, is sea, surf, sea surface temperature upwelling and a couple of climate indices. Okay, so it's suggesting that that's really what's driving the variation in this value in that N15 at the base of the food web. 
but here's that same phenylalanine value um, and very little, no trend through time on that. So this was repeated for these fish and none of them had a trend. And that's informative because these fish live at different places in the water column, right? And I just point out that um, these are pretty low concentrations across the board, actually. Um, these are the two graphs on the left are all the Cascade rivers and on the right are all the um, Olympic rivers, which are only three. And really just focus on the upper panel, which is the N15 um, of that nitrate. And you can see there, there are seasonal changes and it maps on with the hydrology in the Cascades, but that pattern does not exist in the Olympics. Um, so we, we have seasonal effects, it's definitely in their same stream. So this is the Deschutes and the Nooksack are these two lines here. There's a consistent and high delta N15 with nitrate concentration, okay? And um, so this suggests that there is a, anth a anthropogenic source of nitrogen into that nitrate pool, either from humans or from agriculture. All the other rivers show a pretty strong and consistent negative relationship between the concentration of nitrate and the river and the delta N15. And so what that suggests is that whatever the source is that is getting added to that river, it is relatively depleted in nitrogen, which would be not be the human source that we would expect. And it's my pet, we haven't nailed this down, I would say definitively, but my pet hypothesis here is this is um, soil nitrogen derived from alder, right? And it probably is a legacy of historical logging practices where we chop down a lot of forests and alder has regrown in many of those areas. Alder is an end fixer. It fixes nitrogen that comes in at about uh, delta N15 of about zero. And that nitrogen is accumulating in the soils and gets moved into the rivers. Uh, I'd really like to add some of this isotopic data to watershed end models, like the Sparrow model, and um, see if we can kind of match up some, some of the thoughts there about where nitrogen in rivers is coming from and see if that makes sense with the isotope data. And then uh, we can move from just simply trying to identify source, but trying to figure out process. What actually generates um, a, lots of information that's ripe for mining to ask some of the questions that we would like to ask from a scientific perspective, like what is driving the um, lower dissolved oxygen? And there's equally valuable ways of doing different interpretations of models. It's not just you know how much dissolved oxygen is in the water. It's you know the organisms respond not just to quantity but also to variability. Make sure that the modeling um, tools are available, are readily available to the community writ large. Um, so we've set up the, the Silly Sea Modeling Center that Trang is the director of. And we've also done a lot of work in um, taking a production level, taking basically the research model and, and creating a production level model that is, can be run um, more quickly um, and generate a lot more um, scenarios. I mentioned the other way to think of a model, and this kind of riffs off what um, Gordon was talking about, is we really need to think about where the fish are, where the biology is that we're trying to to protect and to maintain a habitat. So we tend to focus more on what is the volume of water that is, um, as, is depleted in dissolved oxygen relative to a reference condition. Um, that, and as we pointed out earlier, that this is a summertime phenomenon. It's also the, the magnitude of the y-axis. This is 0.02% this is of the volume of the water um, is, is impaired in, this, in the summer months in this particular location. The model calculates in three dimensions and calculates every, every day. So we can begin to explore how nitrogen parameters uh, or nitrogen species vary in space and time. We begin to play with this um, and do some scenarios. One of the pieces of information we get is that phenylalanine number and phenylalanine is, does not change dramatically as you move up the food web. So those food web effects that you were mentioning that don't occur in phenylalanine because phenylalanine is an essential amino acid that can't be synthesized by animals. New funding from uh, King County Wastewater, both those other models are being brought into the sort of um, intellectual dialogue here of uh, wastewater treatment plant loading. And so we're, um, 
yep, we finally have funding to do kind of multi-model uh, experiments. Be the Puget Sound Science Review needs that synthesis of, you know, how, how is phytoplankton um, controlled? What what are, what are what's our conceptual model? How does that play out in different kinds of years? Where do we have consensus? What what are sort of the unknowns?